All right, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in to our uh, AIA webinar from AIA Hong Kong. So today we are very lucky to actually have our two speakers from MBBJ, Sebastian Hill from our Hong Kong studio, and also Vivian Ngo from uh, their LA studio. They will be sharing their Tencent uh, Seafront Towers in Zhenzhen. Uh, so it's very sustainable, very innovative tower. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna give it to them now. Okay. Thank you, Vicky. Um, so as you say, you have Vivian and myself speaking today. Um, Vivian in the LA office and was one of the key design members throughout the whole process. Uh, she continues to work with Tencent to this day. Uh, and me being based here in Hong Kong, so I've become more of the on-hand on uh, tour guide for the project more than anything else. So we're going to speak about uh, our project at uh, Tencent headquarters um, based in Shenzhen. Uh, to give you some overview of the project, it's uh, 270,000 square meters. It's uh, split into it's a synergy tower, so two towers together. Um, the first being 246 meters tall, the south, and the north one being 195 meters tall. Um, to give you a bit of background about Tencent and kind of set the scene as well, uh, the average Tencent customer is uh, 26 and the average employee is 27. Um, when I first heard this, I was astounded. It just shows how um, youthful the workforce is within this company and how they use that energy to really drive innovation. Um, it was the first company, a Chinese company, to hit the 500 billion um, valuation mark, um, which shows how progressive they've been globally. Um, and whilst they are known for WeChat mainly, they now own over 700 companies. And one of those, if we just choose one, um, is their gaming company, and now making them the largest game owning, uh, owning gaming company in the world as well. Uh, so with that, I'll pass over to Vivian. So I want to bring everybody back to when it, we were designing Tencent, which is around 2010, 2011. At that time, iPhone 4 as you know, as we like to define our lifetime with uh, Apple products, it was iPhone 4 s That's what it looked like. Most people don't even remember anymore. And at that time, Tencent was this kind of a youngish company. It's kind of new and up and coming. They have a few uh, pretty reputable within China, but a, pretty much unknown to the rest of the world. Um, and they, at that time, they were first launching WeChat and uh, QQ Music and uh, QQ Zone. So the product was mostly limited to the cell phone. Uh, next, please. Um, and about the site, it's kind of located uh, near Nanshan. Uh, it's pretty close to Hong Kong. Uh, you could just get, you know, the, a lot of the buses and even the ferry gets, um, goes close to there. And the site is located at this pointed, uh, uh, pointed intersection between two, uh, between uh, Binghai Road, which is a very busy highway and kind of near the um, Shenzhen University. So then when it was um, kind of coming in, uh, you know, how do we design something that's at the corner facing a very high speed uh, location and also uh, next to, you know, the, there's views of the ocean, the mountain and the city. Next, please. And, and you can zoom in, you can see the site. It's kind of a very uh, curious geometric shape. It's uh, not a triangle, not a square or anything. So. You know, it was a challenge for the team to think about something that celebrates its corner, um, celebrates the fastness of uh, Shenzhen's development, uh, celebrates the sort of the energy that's embedded within Tencent because it's an up and coming company. And we have a show of massing here um, just to show some other constraint we have to work with. Next, please. So we were able to think of what a typical uh, typology would be. It's that, you know, we cannot have a just a block tower um, because you would, it would create a too deep of a floor play, but how do we maximize uh, footage area and, but then, you know, using the geometry of the site to do something new is that we're thinking of this uh, kind of synergy tower. We have to divide the required uh, square footage into two towers and keeping the two, both tower very narrow and thin to maximize the daylight. Um, we also have to have, you know, those um, kind of bright orange, uh, yellow, they're kind of amenity. We still have uh, some area of amenity we need, we need to work with. And amenity, as most of us know, we, we tend to put it at the base of the uh, building uh, for various reasons, because you know our VT strategy will only work that way, our fire exiting will only work that way, um, et cetera. 
but we were we were kind of thinking like can we just challenge this model like why do we need to design for the elevator why do we need to design, design for stairs right we should design for the employee so we want to um, challenge this notion that you can only put amenity stuff um, you know your, your auditorium your your cafeteria at the bottom so we were thinking maybe it could be the bridge that links these two towers and create this vertical campus um, be able to link in these tower have a network culture um, and the reasons being the next next it's being because you know the uh, we can we can think about the synergy the bottom of the tower uh, you know putting amen, amen, uh, amenity at the bottom of the tower is sort of an outdated model it's almost like you know when something that's very straightforward something that is a little bit an analog right in the new world of working in cloud it should be there should be a po new possibility that you can work from anywhere and it should be very um, kind of decentralized. So in a way that we, that's why uh, we started from this evolution of working and how evolution of uh, computing, evolution of digital, uh, from, from analog to digital, and be able to think about um, how we can use these amenity space to create linkages between these two towers. And also by um, positioning the tower kind of in a uh, opening way, be able to take advantage of the um, you know, uh, irregular site uh, geometry and create a, a portal. Next. And also this, uh, we uh, one of the desire from Tencent is that they really wish they could create a campus for their employees, kind of like a university campus, because a lot of these employees are very young. They just pretty much just got out of school. They really still enjoying and pretty much still within the setting of a uh, very school-like setting where everybody's collaborating. There's pretty flat, you know, you and your peers think about some brainstorming ideas, very innovative. You know, you're not, you're not working in a slicky um, glass tower where, you know, all your bosses is watching over you type of deal. They want to really uh, create a, a traditional, almost like a campus, but unfortunately in Shenzhen or, you know, in Hong Kong, like the land is just so precious. So they were only be able to, um, acquire a, a land that is a limited size. So how, you know, they really wanted uh, to challenge us to think about how we can create um, a campus-like feel, but vertical. So we're, we were able to offer them something that is by linking the two towers together, we were able to create these almost quad-like um, bridge that links these two towers together and, and we call it the vertical campus. Next. And um, also, you know, the each of these links have a kind of a meaning or kind of a sim symbolism. The top is link, it's the knowledge link, which uh, we'll go into that later, is where they have the Tencent College and the uh, conference center, um, uh, internal conference. So uh, their employees actually get a lot of these um, big training and uh, their existing tower beforehand, it was always a full capacity. People had to rent other places uh, uh, in, in other area in the city. And it was kind of, you know, uh, uh, making their very inefficient of working. So they were able to think of these big spaces, big training spaces, big Tencent College, uh, big conference center at this link. And the health link, we were able to put the basketball court kind of in between the two towers where, you know, it's sitting on trusses and be able to um, kind of uh, support it. Uh, and then originally in the competition, we also had a swimming pool at this link, but later on it was moved up to the uh, top of the South Tower, uh, sorry, top of the North Tower. Um, but then it's about training, making, it's about the heart training of the heart, you know, bringing uh, kind of longevity of your body. Um, so a, a lot of the employees now, after they finish a meal, they go, go up to this link to be able to enjoy the uh, walking, uh, the running track that kind of uh, wraps around these two tower cores. Um, it's actually a 400 uh, meter uh, link that we're able to give the, a, uh, the employee a place to walk. And the lastly is a cultural link, it's called the leg, uh, which has the expo, the external conference and kind of auditorium uh, spaces. And also um, of, uh, the two cafeterias because cafeterias is kind of a harder to break this um, amenity at the bottom because it has, you know, a, exhaust and, and grease trap, but we were uh, able to push it at the bottom. Okay, next. Um, so we also use kind of a computing computer. Uh, we were able to think about how this tower is being utilized is that, you know, there are, there are, the employees can go up and down and around and all over this place. 
and um, just kind of develop their own journey. They don't need to go up and down because that's limited by the elevator. They could explore their own journey. And we were able to kind of compute how, how each journey is different uh, for each employee every day based on their needs. Next. Um, and then so kind of, you know, after all this is said and done, when we positioned that on the side, we were able to achieve a few things. One is be able to kind of connect the city to the park uh, by having a portal. Second is able to, um, being able to have a, a very nice frontage towards the, uh, the two roads that's binding it. And then also uh, creating a uh, kind of a, uh, relating to the city and more bringing the porosity into the site. Next. And then so does that we kind of, you know, move our uh, lens forward to the world is that, you know, by having this sort of portal to the world and kind of framing the views and uh, di different things, we're able to kind of bring Tencent uh, to the world as their aspiration to um, push their product and their services to the rest of the world. Next. Yeah, this is, uh, this is that portal that we're able to uh, relating to Nanshan and then the technology park. Um, so a few things to share. Uh, this is actually a never seen footage <laughs> by the public. It's what we um, use in the uh, competition. It documents kind of the process. We went from 20 uh, December, it, it's kind of like a six month process from competition um, to at the end where we were selected. And the big arrow on the top is basically when we first submitted uh, our competition. Um, it was five competitors. And at the end with the com when the uh, arrow points that I was two left and we were able, we had to go through an additional four months process of battling out you know kind of how who who get who solved the who has the better design you know uh, just they're just throwing out question to us and how we resolve it and at the end we were chosen after the post uh, competition four months competition next please and there's before um, Sebastian goes through all the, you know, the amazing uh, images that, you know, the finished product, I want to point out like uh, three things to, uh, that you can keep in mind while looking at these uh, very finished products and very uh, beautiful um, uh, photos. Uh, there, are, there are many firsts that uh, for MBBJ and also I, I believe for the consultants. Um, I think uh, some of the uh, four, uh, three things that we're going to go over right now is the collaboration method, structure, and construction and facade later, I'll go over that when um, we go into the facade design. Next. So um, what, what it was interesting was that, you know, it was part of our contract to have a team, uh, not permanently installed, but almost there for a year, uh, working in the 10 cent office at the 24th floor uh, at, that, at that time. And it's basically become a war room. Um, some of the photos I show is that, you know, it's me 10 years early, younger, um, probably 10 pounds lighter. Um, is that, you know, I'm working in the front and there's meeting in the back, you know, the clients coming, you know, at any time almost because they work in the 36, uh, 32nd floor just to see, hey, how is going? Did you solve this thing? So it's actually a constant uh, condition of working and collaboration. That's very exciting, but sometimes, you know, a little bit tiring, but through this process, we were able to collaborate with uh, many of the consultants I listed here. And BBJ has our own team of uh, structure, facade, sustainable, and actually Tencent has their own team. So sometimes there's basically doubling of the, a lot of double um, coordination. Um, it's just to ver basically it's to confirm each other's data is right, because you know, it's a very complicated project. We need almost second opinions or everything. So this collaboration actually for, works um, very, very well and very interesting because we were there on site uh, with them every day. Next. Uh, for structure, um, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert, but uh, I, you know, there's a, a lot of papers out there by AECOM, who is our structure engineer on, you know, how complicated and how innovative this structure is. I'll go over a few things. Uh, first, you know, the diagram is, uh, there's a lot of different types of structure that it's happening in, in different areas. But mo notably is the, the bridges, right? Because without the bridges, it's actually you know, just two towers. But the bridge itself, um, it's and and supporting all the floors above, it becomes a, a giant truss at the bottom. 
So uh, basically all the refugee levels become almost a sacrificial trust only uh, floors that are able to support the floors above it. And um, by having these bridges uh, uh, in between these two towers, it actually uh, ad have added a structural integrity to these two towers. So they almost become very even more stronger uh, by having these bridges connected. So they all kind of work together the same and it's not really an extra thing that you add on to it. Everything is relying on each other. And um, in the circle is a very complicated connection that you know the LDI was very um, kind of scratching their head all the time, but it was able to done is when all these different systems come together, um, some of these connections are able to fabricate it on site. Next. Um, so some of these kind of uh, construction photos, you can see, you know, how uh, there's the side bracing. Uh, it's a composite um, construction, so uh, it's concrete. Uh, everything is wrapped in concrete uh, with it and with the steel, steel inside. And you can see some of these uh, spaces. On, on the right is actually going to be the um, basketball court. This is before all the, the basketball court goes in. You can see how deep the trusses are. They're almost like a five meter, um, a three meter truss that needs to support the um, ETFT e e roof on top and also a green garden on top. Next. And the construction management is very interesting. One aspect is, you know, this is a site, um, it's the dugout, you know, where the basement goes in. And at the first thing is to build the two towers, typical. Um, but then next, what's interesting is how it was being built, the bridge, right? You know, how do you build this bridge that's elevating in halfway into you know 200 meter up in the ground is that they first they built the uh, top bridge on the ground and they hoist it up to the to the upper uh, to so number three is where they hoist up to you know 200 uh, that's probably 100 feet 100 meter sorry and then number four is to build the middle link uh, the middle link is actually much more uh, complicated because it has the four-story clear space uh, basketball court and they were able to build that and then hoist it up. And then, and then last was to build the trust that's at the bottom, uh, the, the, the lobby uh, cultural link. Next. Uh, so these some of some images when it was being lifted up, this upper link being lifted up. And this guy, this poor guy, he's uh, the one who's you know, making sure it matches on, at the top. Uh, I can imagine the tolerance is uh, very, uh, you know, very low, I hope and be able to kind of do everything um, combined, uh, combining at the right moment. Next. Uh, this is a middle bridge being lifted up. Uh, it was such a big uh, show. Everybody, you know, was invited to kind of witness this, um, you know, hoisting this uh, many, many, very heavy structure up in the middle of the, the air. air. Yeah, so at the end, uh, I guess you would get, you know, this uh, look of a bridge connected um, tower look. And I think, uh, Sebastian, you're going to go over the sort of walking walking tours yeah, of the, um, yeah. So I, I hope that what I explained to you is much, you appreciate um, all these spaces much more. Right. Thanks, Vivian. So yeah, that gives you a bit more of an understanding of the, what's gone into making this. And then this looks more at the uh, end results of the spaces that have been created. So starting off with the cultural link, uh, the base of the building, if you get grounds at the legs of the building, linking it to the neighborhood. So as we're looking down, when you're looking at the uh, west side here, the holes in the podium area, that, that's the drop off area. So Tencent have about 15 buses um, circulating per day, bringing their employees to the site uh, and to their work. Uh, looking around to the other side, you can see on the east, this is where you've got the main courtyard area. This is the main drop off for anyone who's going to be visiting um, and visiting the um, Tencent building. If you look to the uh, lower right of the picture, you can see where that link's pushing through the building almost. And that area there is cantilevered out, and that's a 20 meter cantilever. And I think those kind of areas on this particular building is overlooked just due to the sheer nature of the larger gestures of the bridges linking through. So when you arrive into the building, the main lobby space, this is what you see. So at the back of the image, you can see where the escalators are bringing up from that drop off area. Everyone arrives in this central space, and then from there, they split off to the left and to the right to go up into the respective towers. Um, and then all the transfers are then connected at those link bridges to, uh, to maximize people actually interacting with one another. 
So looking over at the plan, you can see that in this area, we have um, an exhibition area, we have a theater area, the main auditorium, a lounge part. So that, um, that theater is where they normally use for white papers and promotional um, areas, new products that Tencent are going to be launching. The screen that you can see wrapped around on the right hand side has LEDs um, built into it. So they can uh, project images into that, giving that kind of feel of that digital environment that you're entering into. Um, on the ground floor area, just by the main drop-off area, you have the brand store. This is a coffee shop which is open to the employees. It also has a lot of merchandise from uh, Tencent. This is that theatre, which is uh, that, ca that cantilever of 20 metres going out. Uh, and then bringing you up to the health link, to the heart of the building. Um, when we look at it here, you can get a glimpse of those rooftop gardens that you can see sitting on top of the link bridges here. Um, inside the heart of it, uh, you see that basketball court, which Vivian was talking about earlier, which the structure is basically built around. Um, this has, this is a full size uh, basketball court. On here, you also can see that on the plan on the left hand side, that running track that runs around. And in between the areas, you also have gym, climbing wall, um, such like. On arriving at the 21st floor, you have the main reception area. So um, Tencent provide all these amenities for their um, employees. And that includes things like a personal trainer. So if you booked a class and you're coming up, um, this is where you would check in, first of all. Um, there's also a juice bar there, um, pool queues that you can get to go to the pool area. A glimpse on the left shows the running track which is running around. Um, you find that normally after lunch, a lot of people are using this as more as a, a walking track on the inside lane. Um, to the right hand side, you can see where you've got those uh, rooftop gardens. And just in these images, it really gives a sense of how important movement is to the to Tencent and encouraging people to interact and be social in this digital, digital age. Uh, so running through these, these are just snapshots of some of the other amenities which are within the health link. And um, when taking people around the building, I'm normally touring people around about half past nine in the morning. And people are like, oh, there's not many people here at this time. However, these are used greatly in the evenings. And the facilities that Tencent have provided their employees are so good that you end up having these employees coming back and using it in their own free time as well. So that really starts um, adding to the culture that Tencent wants to encourage within the company. So even though this is a health link, it's still mixed in with workspaces which you can go off and break out to. And there's some fun interactive things like this video wall on the right hand side, which as you're moving around and past, it interacts with you. Talking about one of the other amenities within the um, building is the swimming pool. While it's not in the health link, as Vivian was saying, it's up at the top of the North Tower, but it's just showing the, the sheer range of facilities and amenities that this building has. Um, it's always interesting talking to commercial clients rather than corporate clients about how, how much amenity space is in there and how you can bring this into a commercial world. So the knowledge link up at the top, like we were talking about, that's the mind of the building. Um, so this is the, the view of that central space. Uh, around this area, it's made up of higher end restaurants. Uh, it's also got meeting facilities, the, um, the library, and the education part. So this is where the internal learning of the company is then taken and passed on to others. So looking at a typical floor, um, whilst we did all the concepts for the spaces, the the programming of it was all us. Um, so where you can see when you're looking at the typical floor plates on the left hand side, you can see the core is a centrally located and then offset. This gives you a different types of workplace within that. So on the outer areas looking out, you have um, a flexible um, workspace and on the inside you have more of the collaboration spaces. This is for meeting rooms. You've got the um, the uh, breakout space and you've also got the, the kitchenette through there. All the floors have this connecting space which is running through so you don't have to be limited for a single team. It allows you to expand over, um, over other floors. Okay, so moving on to the facade. Um, this is something that I, I feel that we're particularly proud of um, as a company. Um, if you look at, if you consider when this was actually built and when 
towers were going up. Most towers back then were these glassy shards. Um, and this is wanted to be something different. So even when you in an area such as Shenzhen, which is incredibly progressive, you have all the best uh, architects practicing here and it's a very new city as well. The facade of Tencent is still something different. And um, when you look at it, it has a far more solid appearance to it all, which is kind of meant to echo back to the idea of the digital cloud computing. And whilst you look at it, it has a structure to the whole thing. It still has a sparkling effect due to the randomization of the paneling as well. So going back to the concept of the tower where you have these synergy towers, a tower which operates as one, but is in two separate parts. So with that, the facade kind of echoes that where the tower has been cracked apart. And you can see the different facade treatment on the outer skin of that and the inside, really adding to the idea of the tension of these two things being what, as one once before, before being cracked. There's also wanting to be the suggestion of movement within the building. So where you see these towers um, are then linked by the bridges, we want to have the sense that there is movement and they're pushing through this kind of cloud texture. So the surrounding areas of that, you have this kind of cleaner facade treatment, given the sense that the bridges move through. Here you can see them. So what, it'd be going from one passing through to the other. And how that looks from far away um, you can get that sense. So the facade comes down to being considered in a different way. So one, you have the, the incline nature of the facade, which helps reduce the solar gains. And the other thing is talking about the ergonomics. So when this is thinking about how can you get two uses out of that facade, this is when you're thinking about, well, actually, how can people operate it? How can they live within it? You want to be connecting people to those views. In that case, you want them to be connected to the facade. And so here you can see that the modulation was taken from the idea of using it as a window seat and people being able to sit there. So you end up getting this 1.8 modulation for the glazing. But going back to how Vivian was talking about this beforehand, it's, it really comes down to the execution of it and us being able to be involved all the way through. I'm going to take over this. Yep. So I think uh, the consistent involvement that MBVJ was able to uh, done here is uh, a little bit uh, atypical. Usually for U.S. firms, uh, we were able to, ha uh, you know, work on the design until DD, and we just had to almost a like clean cut to the LDI, and we were able to do a few a CD or CD review or a few visits, site visit or mockups, and that that is pretty much our limited involvement. As a, as a foreign architect working in China. But in this case, we were uh, uh, a few, a few uh, atypical involvement that we had was that we were responsible for the facade tender set. Um, working, uh, we were working also with Inhabit from Hong Kong uh, uh, on uh, to, throughout the entire process so that we're not, we won't, we will achieve the efficiency of a local knowledge uh, yet our dis and, and still be able to maintain our design intent. Uh, we were able, we were required to monthly visit uh, from LA to, to Shenzhen every month to visit on a site, to look at a few mock-ups, to visit factories. Um, and then we were also involved in the selection of facade contractor, which is something that you typically uh, we don't get to do. So because of all this um, continuous and consistent involvement into the process, we were able to do a lot of really good QA, QC of major uh, construction and maintain the quality. Um, this is what I show here is um, the 1.1800 uh, uh, facade uh, mock-up. And actually it was uh, a little story, a side story is that it, we, when we first designed it, we were designing it for 1.5 meter. But later on, we, we, when we do a full mock-up with the plywood, we realized it's actually too narrow for two people to sit next to each other comfortably. Uh, so we, uh, during, uh, I think in the middle of the DD, we, we had to change this module. Um, it created a lot of chaos, but we were able to do it because at the end, we got a product that's much more into the human, human economics and also up to the, our client's expectation. Next. Uh, just going with a few kind of uh, facade types, uh, there are, you know, a facade types, but the most um, important and most unique is the CW1 and 2, which is our vertical and horizontal sawtooth, and also the skylights on top of the links, the ETFE skylights um, that we, I'll go over um, why they're special. Next. 
uh, and then, uh, yeah, so the ETF is uh, one third, it's pretty big. Uh, and then we were, we had to do a few visual mockups or a performance mockup to make sure the quality is consistent and, and it's uh, not leaking and, you know, it passed all the expectation. And it's because of this that we were able to um, uh, work out a lot of the kinks and able to have a, a, a great product that uh, a great uh, atmosphere and space spatial quality as you've seen earlier in the Sebastian slides. Next. Yeah, so this um, on the top of this, uh, the skylight is the this uh, construction and we were able to make sure that it's uh, waterproof and um, it will last uh, for a long time. Next. Um, and about the sawtooth, uh, one of the things that might not be uh, seen from the outside is actually how it passed the fire proving. It's very nerdy topics, but it was, it actually took a lot of our time to kind of figure out what to do. Uh, because of, you know, our, we were able to have the design intent, this uh, ordered randomness. Um, we, we wanted to make sure this module doesn't sit on, you know, flush with every floor. We wanted to be, have a little offset. So we create this and, and, and be able to create this seat um, that we were mentioning. So uh, these are offset from the, from the floor plate and thus creating this room, this pockets of potential fire uh, transfer, you know, medium. And typically in your facade, if you flush with the, the floor plate as you know, the kind of the section eight typical shows, you could have your fire, uh, fire block kind of within the, under, right underneath the, the floor plate and then you'll be done. But because of this cantilevering module, you know, there is a pocket and we, were, we had to negotiate, uh, go to many meetings to, with the fire marshal in order to, you know, convince them how to uh, arrive at a solution. So we were able to have this almost like a T-shaped extension that was manufactured as part of the module and that was past the approval of the fire marshal as a, uh, as a fire block. Next. And also about the fa uh, facade construction is that because of the cantilevering uh, nature of this facade, um, we had to almost create steel tubes to create to support these cantilever. And you know, for anybody who works with facade, creating steel and glass and and aluminum all together is a nightmare. But uh, because we work, we were able to work with Jiang Ho, which is our um, facade uh, uh, contractor. We they were able to um, make these giant, very thick um, aluminum extrusion, 35 centimeter thick. Um, of these extrusion and then to eliminate the added steel. So at the end, we get a very clean module that is just glass and aluminum and able to support, um, there was a, another photo of like three guys sitting on this cantilevering module and it, it wouldn't budge. So we're able to pass uh, many performance tests and uh, using this extrusion, uh, aluminum extrusion, only aluminum extrusion and glass. Next. Um, and then you can see this uh, module is the 4.5 meter module is actually very big uh, on site. So we have uh, next, we're able to hoist them one by one um, to to make this pattern. And uh, this pattern is because, you know, it looks pretty regular, but every once in a while, if you ever go visit, it, it's slanted the other way to catch uh, some reflection of the sun. So it almost like sparkles in the, in uh, from far away. Next. Yep, so I, that, so this is kind of what I was try trying to say <laughs> is that, you know, it, because of this slanted nature, um, it reflects the light uh, pretty interestingly, especially around sunset. And it becomes a pretty, in, a pretty interesting icon uh, around uh, Shenzhen Nanshan district. Next. So a little bit about what happens 10 years later. So we're here now, 2020, uh, 10 years after Tencent, uh, after we built their headquarters, which is where the red dot is. Since then, they've done way beyond, you know, what we were imagining at that time is that they, they're now involved into media, um, you know, movies uh, and, you know, finance and, and, and a lot more. So they've expanded greatly uh, ten, since uh, we last worked with them. Next. And we were able to uh, fortunately uh, won the competition for this uh, Dao Chang Wan master plan, which now they finally get to have their own campus. You know, 10 years later, it was their desire to, to create a vertical campus with this headquarter, but now they have a real legitimate campus that, you know, have a um, 200, uh, 200, 2 million square meter of space for them to um, kind of 
uh, help their to project their next uh, development of their company. Next. So for the uh, so our idea is for this net city. So what what is net city? It's basically a it's almost the same concept as we are doing the synergy tower. Next. Um, so 10 years ago, we did this headquarter, which is we kind of break down the typical office tower and to try to create this decentralized linking and kind of more organic journey throughout the entire uh, site. And 10 years later for the Dachang one site, we are questioning the, you know, the layout of the, kind of the gridded system, which is very, uh, pr which is everywhere in, in Shenzhen um, to something that's more organic and more, um, uh, you know, uh, organic and kind of a more journey, more discovery, more discovery is allowed. Next. So um, as we talk about, you know, the, the typical city, the grid is for cars. So why, why do we have these blocks? Why do we have these turning radius? Why is, you know, why are these? It's because it's based on, you know, safety of the car driving around, but, you know, and then it's a very centralized network that, you know, you can only go from one place to the next and, and it's not much choice because of, you know, the grid, grid nature. But for the next city, um, we are hoping that we're trying to, wait, what if we, you know, we start designing with the human, you know, journey first and human discovery first. Sim very similar to what we thought when we were designing the headquarter is that it would be, uh, we're using a, a green link to link the, the waterfronts and then, you know, a few, the few transit hub and a few kind of hot spots, we call it the nodes, along the entire um, four kilometer uh, site. Um, and then that, you know, instead of a straight line, we're able to do more organic zigzagging to create now the different angles and kind of break down this grid and this 90 degree angle um, design that we typically see. Next. Um, so this is kind of evolution of what it, it is. You know, it's a four, four kilometer long site. Um, and then, you know, there's a, a waterfront, which is where the green park is. And because of this um, kind of green belt, we call it the common, we were linking the two uh, transit node with various locations along the waterfront and ended up at the end, at the southern part, which is the, um, the future uh, convention center. It's almost as icon for the uh, Shanghai district. And we're able to build in, embed it into a lot of this resiliency, you know, uh, water rise is, what we think the sustainability in these master plan is now is about resiliency. It's, you know, what is sacrificial? How do you deal with, you know, rising sea level? How, how do you uh, uh, plan for storm? Um, so those, those are part of uh, the sustainability thinking that we have is that we create these um, uh, watersheds almost to, to drain the water in case of any um, disaster coming in the future. Next. Um, so at the end, uh, some of these images I show uh, following are kind of the preliminary uh, images that we were able to get uh, work with from the client. We started this uh, five months ago, and since uh, for the past five months, we were uh, kind of negotiating with the, you know, coordinating with various uh, consultants and the client's desire and modification. And uh, so we were trying to doing a lot of coordination the past five months. And uh, so these images are more like preliminary um, as we get into uh, more and more and, you know, when they're kind of partial, these things are for competition and for uh, more uh, uh, detailed guidelines, um, you know, we will have some kind of new images, but these are at the moment what we have now. Um, next, we're just going to go through them quickly. So this is images, these, uh, the circle is what we uh, propose for the convention center. And this is a view of the common. Um, because of we eliminate these um, very straight 90 degree, we are able to create these portals and these views and various angles. So you're never kind of like looking either straight or left or right, right? When you're standing at, a, at an intersection, you can always see different um, various things happening in various paths. So this is what uh, some of this dynamic atmosphere we like to create with when we break down the grid. Next. Uh, this view is from the 10th, the headquarter district. There are five districts in this master plan. The headquarter districts in the middle. Um, we were thinking that we could have a more uh, a lake area that it's a more 
about the waterfront, uh, celebratory of the waterfront, and also Tencent. And we have these uh, linking, linking platform almost as a tree route to reach out to various location instead of, you know, your typical um, podium and a walkway and just very harsh uh, uh, street front. Uh, we're kind of more uh, organic tree root uh, typologies. So you can see more of these um, terracing down um, design here. And at the end, we also have a zone for uh, mangroves uh, restoration uh, because mangroves has been a very important part of uh, Shenzhen or you know the region, uh, even Hong Kong, uh, it's, uh, it's a uh, bio uh, ecology. So because of the recent development of uh, infills and, and reclamation, a lot of them were uh, being threatened. And you know we believe mangrove will be a, a part of the net natural system that will prevent uh, that will add resiliency to our design and to the ecology around Shanghai as well. Yep. And this is the last image. Oh, thank you. So uh, yep. well, it was very in inspirational. Thank you, Sebastian, and thank you, uh, Vivian. The um, so we are now open for Q and A. Uh, so how it works is uh, everyone who is uh, in the audience, uh, you can type in the Q and A. And then, um, Sebastian, if you don't mind, uh, maybe you can read the question uh, out loud and repeat uh, their name uh, and also the questions, and then uh, we can answer them live. Because the, for the recording, they won't be able to uh, actually see the writing. So I wanted to actually get it uh, verbally. And uh, when you're answering the question, I think it will be great if you can uh, move your slide to the appropriate image. So uh, for the recording, uh, we won't actually get stuck in uh, one static images. I'm going to uh, probably uh, begin with the first questions. Uh, actually, uh, Greg, uh, Greg Yeager from uh, Canada right now actually has a uh, very uh, good comment about uh, the presentation. Uh, he said that a uh, very impressive uh, presentation. Happy. Uh, one of the questions coming in from our past president, Ken Howe. Uh, he said, uh, innovative facade design, bravo any seismic consideration? I believe so. Um, I'm, again, I, uh, from what I eavesdropped from AECOM's team, because we were working technically, we're not really next to each other. There was a huge uh, seismic uh, consideration because we had to survive. I don't, you know, I don't take my word for it. We had to survive a bombing or some, some kind of, there was a, almost like a, a, a at a very high standard we need to adhere to in terms of seismic and wind and everything. We had to adhere to a very high standard, even higher than a typical uh, tower in Shenzhen because we have a super, we, we, we exceed a certain limit. So yeah, I, I, think, I think the brazing of the bridge and uh, all the brazing that I showed in the diagram, I think maybe um, Sebastian can go back to the, the kind of the brazing diagram. They all work together to achieve that, to stabilize the, the um, the sheer force of, you know, when, when there's a seismic event. I think it's in the front, yeah. But um, I think, you know, a shout out to AECOM Shenzhen. Um, I think you can search online for their uh, white paper. They publish a few things about this, uh, their structural um, design for this one. It's very impressive. Uh, I'm going yeah, to the, the I'm group a couple of questions together. Uh, another question is coming from uh, Silas, from AIA Shanghai, what was there a budget for your facade and structure at the beginning of your project? I don't know numbers. <laughs> I, know Sorry, I... The, <laughs> I know that at the time the facade, um, not the actual number, but the facade itself cost 1.8 times what a typical high rise facade was costing. Um, mm. But this wow. is one of the things where, when you, you saw what the team did by giving them. Um, the usability so rather than just being something which is something pretty it's you know it's sustainable and it's also a case of people using it so it, you're able to start justifying these things with the client because you know, you're getting more than one use out of it another question related to the facade from matthew Wong from hkia what was the testing regime for the curtain wall design how long did it take 
Uh, there were two performance, uh, I think you're talking about performance mockups. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, it takes, uh, it, I think it was over a week, you know, that was one of our built-in um, site visit is that we group all the testing in one visit. Uh, we, we only tested the three very unique situation, which I mentioned is C, CW1, CW2, and the uh, ETFE one, oh, I think it's at the bottom. Yeah, the ETFE, um, the three types of curtain walls that are atypical, that's unique to our site. So yeah, we did all the wind and the uh, water, uh, and actually one of them failed. Uh, so it's good that we tested that. Yeah, one of the ETFE actually failed and we had to reject it and we had to do it again. So um, I think we did it uh, two times. Another question is from ECY. Thank you for the presentation. It's a great work. A question about the energy saving performance consideration on the facade, especially there is large area for aluminum exposed. Yeah, there was um, a lot of uh, deep a lot of kind of a thermal bridging that we need to consider um, because of uh, what we had uh, in order to uh, have, you know, how do you do the shelf self shading while exposing? It's almost like, you know, you can only have one and then another, um, but we were able to do a lot of, uh, we had to pay attention to these thermal bridging uh, uh, issues that we have. Um, but I think at the end, um, because of these uh, solid nature, and actually you can see some of the area is quite solid and we were able to uh, achieve some uh, added uh, energy savings uh, because that we were able to do uh, self shading uh, on the south tower, oh, sorry, the south tower shading the north tower. So there was um, already uh, some uh, added benefit to, to the facade uh, and, and also the massing right at, at, the, at the beginning. Um, um, yeah, let me see, what, uh, there's actually more questions about, I think there are more questions about this building. Uh, uh, we, I'm going to group the master plan question uh, probably to uh, toward the second half. Uh, also another question from Silas from AIA Shanghai. Tencent is known to be very uh, fungal on building budget. Did you have to convince the top leader at Tencent for extra budget? Uh, yeah, actually we uh, we have numerous presentation um, just to let them know what why we're doing certain things and I mean they were the reason why MBBJ likes to or able to work with a lot of these um, innovative uh, uh, em em companies that they always keep an open mind once they see the value and they see the what what is doing what the performance efficiency they were able to buy in so even the facade is kind of very complicated but they were first when they first saw the facade they they understand that it's something special and they were willing to go through this very rigorous process uh, of designing and constructing and even and, and, and over their their expected budget a bit i think the other thing to be said with that is because it was their headquarters building this is a kind this is a building which becomes the icon for the company as well um, so you want something which is going to stand the test of time and you're investing in your brand for this, um, mm. which helps. Another question from Peter Cho, AIA member. Uh, I'm curious how long it took to get the special curtain wall detail with integrated five stop detail approved by FLS experts. Um, it was a long time, as I mentioned. I think it was something that scars our team member for life because that was the first thing they told me. You know, what is so innovative about the facade? Like, oh, it's the fire blocking because we, we work so hard on it. Um, it yeah, it, it was very hard to convince something that, you know, re that requires the life safety uh, of somebody. So I think the perform one of the performance testing, we were able to do a lot of that and, and able to approve. But it, we, we work with a fire life safety consultant, LDI, fire marshal, um, you know, our facade consultant um, to get, get that's resolved. Yeah. Interesting. I think that's actually most of the questions uh, for the buildings. Uh, there are two more questions uh, about the urban plan uh, that you put together. Uh, one was them uh, was coming from Greg Eager. Uh, he was um, a uh, urban planner working for Carlson RTKL. So he said, uh, "Have you been able to use data science in the planning and design of the DCW project?" Uh, data science, I assume that is like a geo design or like a, a date, big data, um, kind of a GIS type of data. Is it? But um, so we uh, not not at the moment. 
but uh, we were, I think we, we will, uh, as Song is going to the kind of more detailed design of it, um, is that right now we have um, kind of a, a process to kind of get the framework done. I think once we get involved into kind of the framework and be able to convince the city this is what we're trying to achieve, we would be able to um, use the big data and, and kind of use GIS and, and other means of um, uh, geo data to support our um, design. I think it's a little bit unfortunate. We, we, we like to flip the other way, but it's just the, the client's priority is to get the city's approval and, and kind of uh, in order to keep progressing. Otherwise we might, we might design this beautiful thing and that the city doesn't feel like they're involved or have a say and it might, will, it will hurt our design process at, at, in the future. I guess Greg's question is actually related to, uh, you probably heard of the Google um, smart city in Toronto, oh, okay. uh, right? So as they, you know, as Google uh, does, uh, they collect a lot of data and use the data to feed into the city planning. Tencent is actually kind of the equivalent of uh, that Google in, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, so we, I guess, uh, probably his question is related to whether Tencent is actually doing similar th exercise using their yes, database. For sure. They already have their own team of uh, smart city designer. I mean, they, they're pretty much on the forefront. So, but we're not at that stage yet. So I cannot guarantee, I, I cannot really go into detail about what we, is happening, but we are planning everything for it. Uh, we're, we're thinking about, you know, what is the network? How do, what is integrated? Um, how the users be able to um, collect data and, and how, how the data will use to manage this giant master plan, you know, how, you know, how do you calibrate you know, this, the, the energy use or things like that, that it's part of our um, thinking when we were planning this, uh, uh, master plan. Talk about energy. Uh, our past president, JD, has a uh, question. What was the sustainable features for your new uh, DZW campus? Well, we have a very high aspiration during competition is that we wanted to have a net zero, um, self-sufficient island. <laughs> it is very much a, a peninsula. Um, but I think we, I mean, it's still a part of MPBG's aspiration. Um, I think because that we are working with the client right now to get a lot of these uh, uh, government approval, we kind of put that in the back seat, which is a little bit of um, unfortunate. But I think we are we are pushing forward uh, with the most. I mean, because the Shenzhen city already see that island, see this design as the future. So we will. Uh, it will be for sure uh, very uh, sustainable. And I and I mentioned that you know, sustainability now is not just a gimmick, not something say, you know, we're very sustainable. It's actually how it performs and you know, what kind of measures you're planning for the future. How do you uh, accommodate for a storm? How do you accommodate for surges? You know, what is being able to absorb the water? How are you draining the water? So then you know, your, your, your employees can come back and work you know, you know, in a week instead of you know, uh, four months, right? To, uh, so I think you know, all those planning, it's, it's part of the sustainable story that uh, uh, on top of you know energy saving and waste reduction and and, and water saving. Mm. Yeah, that, thank you. I, I think that is actually all of the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, and uh, well, thank you again, uh, you know, for both of our speakers. And uh, well, talking about the master plan that you have uh, on the screen right now, um, we uh, AIA International Region has a conference in uh, November. Uh, we hope that uh, we can actually invite you back uh, by November. Hopefully, uh, you even develop even more details about this master plan. Uh, if your team is willing, I, I hope you can actually share that uh, in our international region conferences, uh, sure. uh, which will actually be open to 3,000 members um, of uh, the AIA uh, international regions. Uh, and uh, that would be actually really lovely. And uh, well, while I have all the AIA audience, uh, you know, uh, here, uh, I'm just going to give an update on uh, where we are today. Uh, originally, we planned a lot of uh, physical event by the end of this week, uh, but unfortunately, uh, as many of you have known, uh, Hong Kong actually uh, banned physical gathering as of uh, yesterday. So, uh, you know, for the month of August uh, and uh, this month, uh, we will likely have uh, more webinar coming up. So uh, stay tuned uh, to uh, our website, uh, to our social media. We will announce more plans uh, to actually meet uh, virtually. So uh, thank you again for everyone who are uh, tuned in. So uh, uh, and uh, Vivian and uh, Sebastian, we actually submit a. Uh, we we'll also send you a formal thank you letter from AIA Hong Kong. So uh, uh, we will uh, get back to you, and also the recording. We will send it back to you uh, for your um, uh, approval before we post it on YouTube. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stop the recording.